to this session of the economics of the internet here at the hudson institute my name is harold for scott roth i'll be your moderator today uh... just a couple of quick housekeeping things at the end of the talk today uh... you're invited to purchase a copy of the book our republican constitution uh, Cash only, unfortunately, uh, but it is a uh, it's a great book. Uh, other housekeeping matter: the next scheduled event is Commissioner Michael O'Reilly of the Federal Communications Commission on October 13th here again at the Hudson Center, and um, uh, we may have a speaker before then. So keep your eyes uh, posted to the Hudson website. The Internet uh, has been an increasing uh, topic before the various federal courts, including the Supreme Court in recent years, on issues ranging from First Amendment to property rights to administrative law issues on the extent to which uh, federal agencies can uh, uh, make regulations over the Internet uh, to just how various federal laws apply uh, in the realm of the Internet. Um, and uh, so we're very honored today to have with us today one of the leading uh, constitutional scholars uh, in the United States, uh, Professor Randy Barnett of the Georgetown Law School. Um, Professor Barnett is a prolific author. He has published uh, a dozen books and countless articles and countless other things. And uh, his most recent book is Our Republican Constitution, uh, which is a very insightful way of uh, looking at constitutional law. And uh, we're all here eager uh, to, uh, to learn from you, Professor Barnett. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, having me. Actually, like one more prop I think I need before I speak, which is my copy of the Constitution. Uh, thanks for all for coming out uh, on this balmy Washington day. Um, technology is an, an important part of our Constitution. Uh, it, it, the founders did develop a structure, and that some of that structure, as I will talk about, has been overridden. Um, and I do talk about this in my book, and part of the overriding has by the 16th and 17th Amendments, which authorizes the income tax and eliminated the direct election of senators. But I think overlooked is the invention of air conditioning as a uh, end of a, what used to be a, a structural check on the ability of government to meet and make laws. Uh, now, they, of course, they can meet year-round in these monolithic buildings. Imagine if they didn't have air conditioning, how much better we'd be. Anyway, um, uh, welcome, to this, uh, welcome to this talk. I'm going to talk about my new book, Our Republican Constitution, Securing the Liberty and Sovereignty of We Are the People. And the book starts in Chapter 1, describing my role in challenging uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Um, chapter 1 begins with how I got involved with that. And all of you have heard of Obamacare, right? And you heard there was a big legal challenge to it, went to the Supreme Court. You all heard about that, right? I want to make sure we're all paying on the same page here. Well, I actually am the guy who thought up the argument for why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. Um, I did it on a blog post on the Politico's uh, blog, The Arena, uh, where somebody was mouthing off about how, of course, this is constitutional. And then I sort of had to decide as I was reading my handheld device that morning, there was a question always posed to us every morning. I'm not on that blog anymore, but the way it worked is they would pose a question and we would, we'd respond if we felt like it. And the question was, is the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional? Uh, and it was prompted by a Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed that had appeared the previous day. And I had read that op-ed, and I had decided on the basis of reading that op-ed that if that is the best argument against Obamacare, then Obamacare clearly was constitutional. In other words, that op-ed did not persuade me. Um, so I woke up the next morning, and there was this question on my handheld about whether Obamacare was constitutional. And and I read a blog post by this guy who was kind of a, um, I'm trying to clean up my language here, jerk, let's put it that way, uh, from a law professor. 
And uh, he was just being very jerky about how, uh, of course, it's constitutional. No serious person would think it was unconstitutional. And so it just sort of provoked me. And I had to decide whether I wanted to blog about this or not. And I thought, because, you know, if you, if you do it, then you're kind of in all day. You have to write something out, then you go back and forth, and you're sort of committing your day to doing this. And so you have to decide whether you want to do it or not. I said, what the heck? So I started, well, let's just start the old-fashioned way. Let's read the Constitution and what it says about something like this. And one thing led to another, and I had developed this argument that the individual insurance mandate was unprecedented. As a result, it could not be supported by any previous doctrine that the Supreme Court had actually enunciated because they wouldn't have covered this situation. It hadn't happened before. And given that, what was the court likely to do, or what might the court do when confronted with the mandate to make you do business with a private company, something that um, was established later had never been done in the history of the country. So that's where it got started. It went to there from there to the Federal Society at the Mayflower Hotel, uh, as I discussed, where some group was talking about it and asked me if I wanted to get involved in, the in, in objecting to it. And I said, OK, I will. And I ended up going with the Heritage Foundation, writing a legal policy memorandum. And then what is interesting is we had an event to promote the argument of why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. Senator uh, um, Hatch was our keynote speaker. But what had happened is all the senators had a, uh, have a prerogative to raise a point of constitutional order. Um, that a particular bill is unconstitutional. And generally speaking, these are just pro forma motions because everybody votes the way they vote on the bill. So if you're for the bill, you say it's constitutional. If you're against the bill, you say it's not. So it doesn't really change anything. But the Republicans in the Senate were not going to raise a point of constitutional order about the Affordable Care Act, we were told, because they couldn't think of an argument as to why it would be unconstitutional. So the most important part of our Heritage Foundation program, and this was by now in um, the uh, early December, um, uh, or late November of um, uh, 2009, is we moved, it was the meeting we had upstairs with staffers in which we explained to them what our theory was as to why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. And it was after that meeting those Republicans in the Senate did decide to make a point of constitutional order, and a debate was held on the floor the day before the bill passed on Christmas Eve, and uh, people cited our memorandum, our, our, our Heritage Foundation paper. Um, and what was important about that debate, it was this party-line vote, but every single Republican voted that the law was unconstitutional. Every single Republican senator voted that. Uh, then the next day, the bill passed. But the debate about constitutionality had been uh, uh, up on C-SPAN. Um, and because of that, it became very public. And talk radio started picking up on it. I started getting fielding calls from reporters because my name had been mentioned in the debate. Um, and by the time the bill finally passed in March of 2010, uh, at that point, 12 attorneys general of the United States was prepared to file a lawsuit on the basis of this theory as to why it was unconstitutional. They did file that lawsuit, and then gradually they accumulated more and more attorneys general. So at the end of the day, 28 states were objecting to the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. So what happened during the course of the two years between thinking of why the bill might be unconstitutional and three historic days of oral argument Three I mean, you probably don't realize this. You probably think that would be normal. But in fact, normal oral argument for every single case, no matter how important, is 60 minutes, period. That's it. Every, each side gets 30 minutes. That's it. Um, there was, there, I think in the campaign finance case, the McCain-Feingold case, they actually allocated, I think, two or three hours to that case. We had eight hours of oral argument spread over three days. There hadn't been a multi-day oral argument since the Miranda case was argued in the 1960s. Uh, so this was an unprecedented um, uh, hearing that we had. Um, and so we went from an argument that most law professors had dis missed as frivolous to three days of oral argument in the Supreme Court. And not only that, not only that, but for an argument that law professors had dismissed as frivolous and even sanctionable, one law professor of Florida State said any attorney that signed a pleadings that, that relied upon this argument could be sanctioned for having made a frivolous argument. That law professor of Florida State is now a colleague of mine at Georgetown. Um, so he got a promotion, right? Um, not only that, but we got five votes for our theory that an individual purchase mandate is unconstitutional. Five justices said we were right. Um, that such a mandate was beyond the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause, its Commerce Power and the Necessary and Proper Clause Power. I'll say more about those in a minute. And yet, you may also know we lost. You may have heard that, too. We lost. Now, normally, when you win on the law, you win the case. That's 
the way it's supposed to go, as the way it normally does go. And yet, though we convince five justices of the soundness of our legal argument about the uh, individual insurance mandate, we still lost. And we lost because, as it turns out, getting the Constitution right, even getting the doctrine right, is not enough to win. We also needed a better understanding of the proper role of judges in a constitutional republic, something about which many conservatives and Republicans have been wrong about for a very long time. Now, my last book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, The Presumption of Liberty, was about how getting the Constitution right means identifying its original public meaning. And then the book also goes into what that public meaning is with respect to clauses like the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. This new book, Our Republican Constitution, is about the proper role of judges in enforcing that meaning. Because it turns out you need a different kind of argument to explain to people today why judge, what judges should be doing when it comes to enforcing the Constitution. Since the rise of the modern conservative movement, conservatives have preached judicial deference to popularly elected legislatures under the rubric of judicial restraint. Judicial restraint. It used to be called in the old days judicial self-restraint. And even after my friend and hero, Ed Meese, came to town as Ronald Reagan's attorney general, even after he added a commitment to originalism to the conservative constitutional agenda where it previously hadn't been so prominent, conservatives like Robert Bork professed adherence to the Supreme Court's precedents that had already overridden the original meaning. And here's what he said. Here's what Robert Bork said in his ill-fated confirmation hearings about the role of precedent and its relationship to the original meaning of the Constitution. Bork said that the broad powers upheld by the Supreme Court under, quote, the Commerce Clause and federal powers generally was probably not intended. But these precedents have to stand because it is too late in the day to overturn them. Too much has happened. Too much has grown up around them. Statutes, institutions, expectations, and so forth. I have said, meaning he, Bork, has said, I have said that about a number of areas. So I don't think an originalist, a person who believes in original intent, can do without a doctrine of precedent. Otherwise, he would be constantly trying to rip up the nation and its laws, and you can't do that. Or, as Justice Scalia put the matter with his characteristic bluntness, quote, I may be an originalist, but I am not a nut. <laughs> and he was contrasting himself, actually, with Justice Thomas, who has much less regard for precedent than Justice Scalia had. And not that he was really calling Clarence Thomas a nut, but they have a jocular relationship. They had a jocular relationship with each other. They were very, very close friends. Moreover, Bork, Scalia, and other good conservatives refused to acknowledge the original meaning of such rights-recognizing provisions as the Ninth Amendment, and the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th. The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Conservatives don't think that means very much. The Privileges or Immunities Clause says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. These are two provisions that have virtually never been used by the Supreme Court, ever. Even though they're in the Constitution, if you came down from Mars and somebody read you those provisions, you'd say, well, that sounds pretty important to me. And then you'd find out, no, 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 doesn't really mean anything. Now, when Justice Scalia was confronted with a Ninth Amendment argument in a case called Troxel versus Granville, uh, let me tell you about a little bit about Troxel versus Granville. It's not a famous case, but it's a very interesting case. So it was decided in 2000, and the issue is whether a parent had a right to raise her child as she saw fit. What had happened in Troxel was a mother uh, did not want visitation rights, did not want the grandparents of her estranged husband uh, to have visitation rights with her kids. And eventually a family court ordered that she must let the kids see the grandparents of the estranged husband. And she took this to the Supreme Court and she asserted the right to raise her kids as she saw fit. And the majority of the court recognized that right. Now, if those of you out there think the only rights that are judicial, ought to be judicially protected are the ones that are expressly listed in the, in the Constitution, well, then you have to believe you have no constitutional right to raise your own children as you see fit, that there is no constitutional barrier to a state taking away your children from you and raising them as, they, as it sees fit. 
Nothing in the Constitution stops it by expressly, if that's what you think. That you think the only rights we have are the ones that are mentioned. And yet a majority of the court said there was such a right. And Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas was with the majority, I should tell you. Justice Scalia dissented. And he considered the Ninth Amendment argument that I talked about. I read you the Ninth Amendment about the rights retained by the people. He said he did not deny the, the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment. Here's what he said. He says, in my view, a right of parents to direct the upbringing of their children is among the inalienable rights which it, with which the Declaration of Independence proclaims all men are endowed by their creator. Sounds pretty good so far. Secondly, in my view, that right is also among the other rights retained by the people, which the Ninth Amendment says that the Constitution's enumeration of rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage. That also sounds good. Sounds like he's going to side with the majority. He's going to, he's going to uphold the challenge, right? Kind of like John Roberts. We'll get to that. But then he does his pivot. And the pivot is what this book is about. And here's his pivot. Next sentence. The Declaration of Independence, however, is not a legal prescription conferring powers upon the courts. And the Constitution's refusal to deny or disparage other rights is far removed from affirming any one of them, and even further removed from authorizing judges to identify what they might be and to enforce the judges list against laws duly enacted by the people. So you notice what he did here. He conceded meaning. He conceded the meaning of the text. He conceded that the right was included within the meaning of the text. And then he pivots to the argument about judicial role. What's the role of judges in dealing with the text? That's why I had to write this book. We're going to see this again in the Obamacare case very soon. That's how the Obamacare case came out the way it did. Now, Justice Scalia's position, and Robert Bork's position also, is not an unprincipled one. However, unfortunately, it's based on principles that modern conservatives have inherited from the left. And by left, I mean the political progressives of the early 20th century. In my book, I devote a whole chapter, chapter 5, to the rise of progressivism and what I call the democratic constitution, which I contrast with the republican constitution. Those who adhere to a democratic constitution view we the people as a group. We the people as a group. And it's a group that's entitled to rule according to its will, the will of the people. All of this, I hope, will sound very familiar to you. But the will of the people obviously cannot be the will of each and every person because that would be unanimous and we don't ever have unanimous agreement to anything, right? So the will of we the people can only be the preferences of who? A majority of the people. So therefore, under this conception, a democratic constitution is needed to establish mechanisms by which the preferences of the majority can be represented and then enacted into law. Enacting a majority's preferences into law is exactly how Robert Bork referred to it. And anything that interferes with the will of the majority, like, for example, unelected, unaccountable judges, is suspect under this rubric of we the people as a group, leading to a democratic constitution. Now, this was the argument that was made and formulated by political progressives against a judiciary that was obstructing their effort to enact their progressive political agenda. In the book, I tell the story about how progressive presidents like President Theodore Roosevelt, he was a progressive. You may not remember that, but he was. He actually, after he served two terms as president, one term he got in because the president got assassinated. He actually was never elected president the first time around. He was an accidental president. Then he got reelected. Then he was out, sat out, and he came back to run for reelection. He ran for the Republican nomination. The Republicans denied him the nomination because he was too progressive. And so then he split off and he formed the Progressive Party. Now, you have heard it is called the Bull, Mo Bull Moose Party named after, you know, sort of him himself, right? But it was called the Progressive Party. He called it the Progressive Party. He created the Progressive Party. That split the Republican vote and allowed progressive Woodrow Wilson to become president. Sounds almost like today, right? Sounds very similar to what's going on, right? So we have progressive Republican Teddy Roosevelt, um, progressive Democrat Woodrow Wilson, Progressive Republican Herbert Hoover, yes, he was a progressive as well, and a progressive Repo uh, Democrat FDR, all appointing justices who adhered to this democratic notion of the Constitution and the will of we the people and that they need to get out of the way of popularly enacted legislatures. So I tell that whole story in the book. 
And then I tell a very interesting story that's relatively unknown. And that is how in 1946, after the Republicans took control back of Congress, which apparently Democrats thought were never going to happen again, some on the court began to backtrack from their commitment to judicial restraint. For this deviation, they were labeled, for the first time, judicial activists by progressive historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. How many of you have heard of Arthur Schlesinger, Jr.? Good old New Dealer, Harvard uh, historian. And he's the one that coined the phrase judicial activist to describe some of the justices on the court in this wonderful profile he, he wrote up in Fortune magazine, which I talk about at length in my book. And I actually urge you to find that magazine article on microfilm someplace. Uh, because it's a really interesting dissection of the court. And he contrasts what he calls the judicial activist who he associates with the Yale Law School. William O. Douglas was a Yale guy. He associates it with the Yale Law School um, and the legal realist school of the Yale Law School who just basically are interested in results and they don't care about anything other than res good results, right? That's what legal realism does. And he contrasts the Yale people, what he calls the judicial activists, with the, what he calls the lions of judicial self-restraint were the old-fashioned New Dealers who said judges should get out of the way of legislative majorities. He didn't mention that most of those guys were Harvard guys. So you actually had a Harvard-Yale split on the Supreme Court at that point. You had the activists versus the restraint people. Um, but when the modern conservative movement was then founded in the 1950s, this is like right after 1946, and in the 60s and the 70s, you know, with William Buckley and the National Review, Conservatives ha embraced the stance of, judicial, of the judicial restraint progressive justices of the New Deal against those of the activist progressive justices of the Warren Court. So essentially, they took sides between two variations on progressivism, is what conservatives did. And they threw in with the restraint progressives. So even as Republicans, these conservatives were actually small d Democrats, adhering to the Democratic Constitution's vision of we the people as a group. Now, this may have been the only respectable choice to make as a professor at an elite law school or a student at an elite law school, but it was a false choice nonetheless. Choosing, you have to choose between restraint and activism. That's a false choice. What had been lost at this point was a vision on which our Republican Constitution was based, a vision of we the people as individuals. I mean, the way I describe we the people as a group and the will of the people and the will the people should rule, I hopefully describe that in such a way as you thought, well, that's, I know all that, and it's almost obviously true. What other vision of we the people could there be? And now I'm going to tell you what that other vision is. We the people as individuals. It is revealing that Justice Scalia, in his Troxel dissent, cited the Declaration of Independence, only to dismiss its relevance as law. As I explained in the first chapter of our Republican Constitution, the Declaration was the founding document of the United States, which declared the principle on which this country was founded. And that principle was, first come rights, then comes government. First come we the people as individuals, who are endowed with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then the next sentence says of the Declaration, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So first is the affirmation of rights, the individual rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are not group rights. And then to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now, these governments that are instituted amongst us are not us, and they do not express our will. Governments, under this vision, are our servants. They are our agents. They are our servants, and they're tasked with a job to do. And their job is securing our rights as sovereign individuals. A, under this vision, a good constitution is a Republican Constitution that both empowers a government to energetically secure our rights, that is the reason to have it, while at the same time protecting the rights retained by the people from being violated or infringed by their servants or agents in the government. 
A Republican Constitution, under this vision, therefore, provides the law that governs those who govern us. Here's my copy of the Constitution. It's actually the copy of the Constitution that's published by the Cato Institute. You might recognize the maroon cover. Uh, what I like about the Cato Institute's version of the Constitution is they randomly insert the word liberty throughout the text of the Constitution. No, they don't do that. They just wanted to see if you still were paying attention. Some of you I'm not sure were, but now I'm hoping I got you back now. All right, so this is the Cato Constitution. Here, this, this is the Constitution, all right? This is not the law that governs us. This is the law that governs those who govern us. Then they make laws to govern us. But this is the law that governs them. And those who are to govern us, can, under this law, can no more change the law that governs them without going through the amendment process than we can change the laws they make to govern us without going through the legislative process. So that means the meaning of this Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. And they can't change it by amendment. That's an argument, by the way, for originalism. The original meaning of the Constitution is, how, is what that means unless it's properly changed. Um, I also should mention that even though I said there's no such thing as unanimous consent, and we don't unanimously consent to be governed by the government of the United States because we're never really even asked for our consent, but every single person who governs us under this document, every, every officer of the United States government and every officer of the state governments take an oath to follow this law. There is unanimous consent to follow this law by those who are governed by it, which are those who govern under it. Under a Republican Constitution, judges, too, are servants of the people, and they have a job to do. And their job is to keep all the other governmental actors in line and playing according to these rules. Their duty is to enforce the Constitution against any statute or law that exceeds the just powers of any Republican legislature. Remember, the Declaration refers to deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Not all powers, not unlimited power, not any power, but their just powers from the consent of the governed. And in a conflict between an individual member of the sovereign people, us, and their servants in the government, them, Judges are supposed to provide what James Madison called independent tribunals of justice. They're supposed to be independent and impartial, not siding with the government against us. But this was not the view of judges that modern conservatives adopted. Between their commitment to judicial deference to majoritarian rule by legislatures, to their acceptance of precedents that, had, that they admitted to be contrary to the original meaning of the Constitution, to their insistence that whole clauses of the Constitution, like the Ninth Amendment and the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, were unfit for judicial enforcement, judicial conservatives gave us, a, and political conservatives, gave us a very tepid commitment to the original meaning of the Constitution. And then they gave us Chief Justice John Roberts. Now, I believe that John Roberts is a good and decent man. I know he was a brilliant Supreme Court advocate. And though I've only met him a few times, I would be happy to have him as a friend. But John Roberts was selected by President George W. Bush because he was a judicial conservative who hewed to the doctrine of judicial restraint, or what he called during his confirmation hearings, judicial minimalism. Now, in my book, I explain how that commitment to judicial restraint gave us Obamacare, perhaps forever. Now, on the one hand, like Justice Scalia had done in the Troxel case with respect to the right of parents to raise their own children, John Roberts affirmed the Republican limits on the scope of federal power by holding, by providing the fifth vote to hold that individual purchase mandates were beyond Congress's power under the Commerce and Necessary and Proper Clauses. But then he pivoted like Justice Scalia did, and he invoked the Democratic Constitution's mantra of judicial restraint adopting what he called a, quote, saving construction, unquote, that turned the individual insurance requirement, which is what the statute called it, that was enforced by a penalty, which is what the statute called it, into an option to buy insurance or to pay a modest, non-coercive tax. And his reasoning depended on the fact that the tax specified in the, the penalty specified in the bill was so modest as to be non-coercive and not make you buy insurance. You had an option. You had a free choice. If it was too high, you would be coercive, and then it would be unconstitutional. 
which, by the way, is one of the things we did win in the case. Had we lost the case on Commerce Clause grounds, then under a Commerce Clause regulation, Congress would in the future be free to jack up the penalty for not having insurance as high as they wanted and put you in jail for not having insurance. But under Roberts' theory, they can't do that because it accepted our theory that that is unconstitutional. But here's how he justified his saving construction in which he changed what he called the natural meaning of the statute, which is what we were challenging, into what he called a reasonably possible reading of the statute, which is what he upheld. He said, granting the act the full measure of deference owed to federal statutes, it can be so read. Notice the deference is playing the work here. Judicial role is playing the work here. It's the job of judges to defer. And then he defended this move by insisting that, quote, it is not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. I'm going to come back to that sentence in a moment. Now, perhaps he expected the split the baby approach to be received by conservatives with equanimity. Oh, but it wasn't. Many on the right were outraged because they believed that it was the job of the Supreme Court to hold Congress to its enumerated powers and thereby protect the liberties of we the people from even a bare majority of Congress who had enacted the Affordable Care Act. In this way, the Obamacare decision was a political inflection point in, which, in how conservatives conceive of the role of judges. As a result of Roberts upholding Obamacare in the name of judicial deference, a, the trend among conservatives has moved sharply away from judicial conservatism and restraint towards what I think is better called constitutional conservatism. It is actually often called constitutional conservative. That's what Mark Levin, for example, calls it. Mark Levin blurred my book. He was, I'm very grateful to him, as did Bill Kristol. And Rob, George Will wrote the foreword to the book, and my, Senator Mike Lee wrote a nice blurb for it, too. Uh, it's a very good company. And, and they all call it constitutional conservatism, not judicial conservatism. And under constitutional conservatism, that favors judges in upholding the original meaning of the Constitution, even if it means invalidating a popularly enacted law. But sadly, we now see that while John Roberts' ruling in the Obamacare case led con constitutional conservatives to turn against or turn away from judicial restraint, it also caused Republican voters to turn against constitutional conservatism and even against the Constitution itself. Let's recall the state of American politics that leads up, led up to the Obamacare decision because it's going to seem like a different world than we're living in today. A popular movement calling itself the Tea Party arose spontaneously to oppose the Bush bailouts, and car uh, the Bush bailouts of the banks and the car companies. Then, with the election of President Obama, it turned its attention on Democrats' efforts to finally achieve their dream of putting the government in control of each of our doctors in the same way they have taken control of the teachers who educate our children. Using the Internet, which is the subject of this uh, lecture, of this series, and free conference calling, that also played a crucial role, the Grassroots Tea Party organized nationally to resist this by employing the checks and balances provided by our, by our Republican Constitution. The Affordable Care Act that had emerged from the Senate was never intended to become law. It was merely the means to get 60 votes to get the mill no, out of the Senate. They had to get some, like Ben Nelson and a few other Krauschen voters, to vote to get add on to the 60 votes to get out of the Senate into a conference committee with the House, and then the real health care bill was going to be written. But by electing Scott Brown, senator, to replace Ted Kennedy in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, Tea Party activists stopped that from happening. It deprived Democrats of their 60-vote majority in the Senate. And now they couldn't just write the new bill in the House, in the conference committee, and then go back. Either the House must accept the Senate bill in toto, and they objected, many of them objected to it because it didn't have a single payer and it wasn't, it, it wasn't, didn't have a public option. They had their objections to it because it wasn't radical enough. There would be no fundamental transformation of our health care system unless they swallowed their pride and took the Senate bill. And by the time they did that and accepted the Affordable Care Act, the states in our Republican Constitution had mounted a legal challenge against the law on the theory that was presented in our Heritage Foundation legal memorandum. And then, 
While that lawsuit was still pending, the Tea Party elected enough new constitutionalist members of Congress to flip the House to Republican control, ensuring that if the law was invalidated by the Supreme Court, a single payer or some other variation on socialized medicine that we couldn't object to constitutionally, I must tell you, then could not be enacted. And the Tea Party did all that despite having their organizing efforts suppressed by Obama's IRS. For two years, the nation was transfixed by the legal challenge to Obamacare. A genuine popular constitutionalist uprising, uprising had set the stage for a renewal of our Republican Constitution. Tea Party activists and just plain old Republicans looked to the Supreme Court to uphold a limit on the growth of federal power. Not to cut federal power back even, just to stop it from growing more. Now true, Democrats and left intelligentsia would have screamed bloody murder had the law been invalidated the way they did scream bloody murder, uh, first of all, after Citizens United, which I believe was a shot across the bow to warn the court not to do anything about Obamacare. And secondly, after it looked like after three days of oral argument, we had five votes to invalidate the law, then they just went berserk. Starting with the president, to the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Pat Leahy, to a bunch of other people, even though they did that, polls show that had the court invalidated the law, a majority of the American people would have supported that move. And it would have taught the American people an invaluable lesson about their Constitution and about the courts. No American knew about the Gun-Free School Zone Act that the court had violated, uh, that the court had invalidated in the Lopez case in 1995 because it had exceeded Congress's power. Most Americans were clueless about the civil cause of action for gender-motivated violence that the court had invalidated in the Morrison case in 2000. And only a minority of Americans truly cared about the use of medical marijuana that the court had failed to protect in the 2005 case of Gonzalez versus Raich. And I should tell you, I was the lawyer that represented Angel Raich in that case, and I argued that case in the Supreme Court. We lost that case six to three. But virtually everyone who paid any attention to public affairs was aware of our challenge to Obamacare. Every one of you was aware of it. Had it been invalidated, and the decision remanded to a now divided Congress to devise a new and perhaps even genuine reform of the existing regulations of health insurance, which really was needed, it would have shown the American people that there were indeed limits on the power of Congress. And more importantly, it would have shown the Tea Party constitutionalists that their efforts had finally paid off. They had put their faith in the Constitution and the courts, and that faith was rewarded. But instead, what they got was a good, hard kick in the teeth. And it was my wife that made me say kick in the teeth. As a former prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, a different part of the anatomy had originally come to mind. And the effect of that kick in the teeth was felt in the Indiana primary where Donald Trump beat Ted Cruz. Listen again to the words of John Roberts to the Tea Party activists who are counting on him. Quote, it is not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices, unquote. Now, what else did that mean to them? If not, it is not our job to uphold the limits on federal power. Go away from the courthouse. Go away from the judges. Go away from the Constitution itself and fight this out amongst yourselves. Law exists now, in part, to direct the natural urge for self-preservation and self-defense into peaceful channels. The Constitution exists to provide the law that governs those who govern us. And the, and the judiciary was created, in part, to hold the government to its just powers and, by so doing, avoid a Hobbesian political war of everybody against everybody else. But at the very moment he was called upon to teach the American people the value of their Republican Constitution, Chief Justice Roberts asserted the re judicial restraint of the Democratic Constitution, and he turned them away. And that, my friends, was the end of our constitutional moment. That was the beginning of the end of constitutional conservatism as a political movement, and it rekindled, and it, and it helped kindle. It was not the only thing, but it helped kindle the resentment and populism that led to Donald J. Trump.
And this thesis, if you want to know where I got this whole thesis of this talk from about Trump, it's from my Twitter feed. That's where it comes from. Listening to Trump supporters talk about the Constitution, listen to them talk about John Roberts, listening to them talk about Obamacare and how much good being a constitutional conservative like Ted Cruz did anybody. That's what they say. Not everybody, enough. Now, when I began law school back in the 70s, I loved the Constitution. And then I took constitutional law. And I read Supreme Court opinion after Supreme Court opinion that explained how every clause of the Constitution that limited federal power didn't really mean what it seemed to mean. And we were taught that every Supreme Court case that reigned in federal or state powers, like the evil and dreaded case of Lochner v. New York, for example, was, was evil and to be repudiated. That's what we let read. And so by the time I finished my constitutional law class, I was finished with the Constitution. My attitude was, if the Supreme Court didn't care about the Constitution, then why should I? When I became a law professor, first I became a criminal prosecutor because I went to law school to be a criminal lawyer, and then when I became a law professor, I became a contracts professor where writings are still taken seriously, where there, where there is a law of contract that people follow. And only very gradually and reluctantly did I kind of get sucked into constitutional law like Al Pacino and Godfather II, and just when I was out, they pulled me back in. And I credit the Federalist Society, or I blame the Federalist Society for having had this effect on me. Now, after Chief Justice John Roberts' decision to uphold Obamacare, while conceding the validity of our constitutional objections, it almost would have been better if he'd have sided with the progressive justices and said we were wrong. But he said we were right, and he still upheld the law. Those who were once again putting their faith in the Constitution reacted as I had. If the Supreme Court did not care about the Constitution, why should they? What good was the Constitution? Why bother? In some, like the left-wing critical legal studies movement of the 1980s in law schools, Chief Justice Roberts told the people that there were no constitutional limits on federal power. There was only politics. Remember, that's what he said. Politics, politics, politics. Now go out and get your own Obama to right whatever wrongs you think you suffer. And now, they have. And their new political paladin's name is Donald Trump, a man who knows nothing about the Constitution and who couldn't care less. Now, it's hard to think of two people who are as different from each other as the well-mannered John Roberts and the crude Donald Trump. Yet, in the end, they both believe that courts ought to bend to political will, at least when the chips are down. Donald Trump is what John Roberts told Republicans that they needed to find. And now they've found him. Now what? What do those of us who still believe in our Republican Constitution do now? now? I don't pretend to have all the answers. Heck, actually, I'm not sure I have any answers. But I will tell you what I rec recommend in the conclusion of our Republican Constitution in the last chapter. I say there, quoting the book, the first thing we need to revive our, Consti our Republican Constitution is to remember our constitutional heritage. This, frankly, is the principal purpose of this book. A book can only do so much. It's only a book. The one thing it can do is provide a narrative that you can hope to carry around in our heads instead of that democratic constitution narrative that, constitutional, that conservatives have been carrying around in their heads since the 1950s, since they got it from the New Deal Court. A Republican narrative that begins at the founding and carries through to the formation of the anti-slavery Republican Party that greatly improved the Constitution by providing much-needed federal constraints on state power, including the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, which was given to us by Republicans. And to remind us how progressive justices replaced our Republican Constitution with their Democratic one by means of living constitutionalism. With the exception of certain favored rights that the activist progressive justices deem to be fundamental. So they will make exceptions to restraint, but only for the rights they deem to be fundamental. The courts get to decide which of our liberties are fundamental and which are not. That's the activist part of this divide. In short, conservatives need to rediscover the difference between a democratic and a constitutional republic. Remember, if it was John Roberts who gave us Donald Trump, it was judicially conservative Republicans who gave us John Roberts. 
By the way, I remember walking around Federal Society conventions and gatherings and talking about who justices might be appointed by Republican presidents in the future, and people kept mentioning to me this guy, John Roberts. And my reaction was, who's John Roberts? I've never seen this guy. I've never met this guy. I've never heard this guy talk about anything. I don't know what he stands for. He's supposed to be this brilliant advocate is what they told me. He's a great Supreme Court advocate. But I didn't know what he stood for. I didn't know what his principles were. It turns out it's a bad sign. It's a, it's not, you shouldn't put people on the court you've never heard about, who've never said anything about the Constitution, that you know what they think, because they're supposed to be super smart and graduated from Harvard Law School. Second, we need what I call in the book, I went to Harvard Law School, so it's okay for me to dump on them, all right? So just, just so you know. Second, we needed what I call in the book a Republican politics and a constitutional Republican party. For better or worse, our Republican Constitution provides the process, that the process of selecting judges and justices will be a political one. An elected president nominates judges and an elected Senate confirms them. Our Republican Constitution will not be restored in our two-party system until one of the two major parties embraces it as a central plank of its political platform. The natural home of the Republican Constitution is the Republican Party the modern Republican Party, the antecedent of which was responsible for completing the work that the founders had only imperfectly begun. This is not yet the Republican Party of today, the rise, and the rise of Trump threatens to purge the party of any commitment to constitutional conservatism. It's one of his biggest dangers, by the way. But if the existing Republican Party will not be a constitutional Republican Party, then we need to replace it with a new second party that will. Parties die. The Whigs died and it was rep and because they couldn't deal with the slavery and the territory question, and the Republicans arose, the Republican Party arose to deal with it. Parties die, and this party may need to die if we're going to have a constitutional Republican Party on the right. Now, when I wrote my book, I confess I had in mind a constitutional conservative Tea Party candidate like Rand Paul, who I ended up working for on his presidential campaign, or Ted Cruz, who I know and admire elevating the constitutional wing of the Republican Party, which was only a wing, over that of the GOP establishment. But now, thanks to the anti-constitutionalist populism unleashed in part by John Roberts' decision in the Obamacare case and others, we have Donald Trump. So now what do we do? On the one hand, I think the temptation is strong to support Trump over Clinton in the hopes that he picks a constitutionally conservative justice to replace Justice Scalia. If Hillary Clinton is elected, we can be assured of losing the court for a generation. This is the strongest argument for Donald Trump. In fact, in my view, it's the only argument for Donald Trump. And the names that he volunteered in the presidential debate, such as Judge, Judges Diane Sykes or Bill Pryor, were excellent picks. Diane Sykes is probably my number one choice for the Supreme Court, and he named her during the presidential uh, debates. And then he issued a list of 11 people, and on that list, all the people I know are good people. I'm a little suspicious of the ones I don't know, just because I didn't know John Roberts either, and I had the same, I don't, I don't go for people I don't know that well, but still, the people I do know were good, and that, that was on his list. But I have to tell you, I have as little confidence that Trump will choose any of these people to be judges as I do that he's going to build the big, beautiful wall that he's promised. Especially when someone explains to him that constitutional conservative judges are put there to say no to him, then what will he do? Who will he pick? I think I know who he'll pick. I think he'll pick good old-fashioned judicial restraint conservatives whose job, who don't think their job is to say no. They think their job is to say yes. And he'll get kudos for that because these are going to be old, reliable, credentialed judges who are judicial restraint people like the conservatives used to have, believe in before Obamacare. That's who he'll pick, and he'll get, he'll get praise for it. They still, by the way, might still be better than the ones the Democrats pick, even then. But I'm just telling you what he's likely to do. Perhaps the need for a constitutional Republican Party argues for sitting out this election. If Trump is elected, then the populism for which he stands will be vindicated, and the Republican Party will be remade in his image as a European-style right-wing nationalist party. That's what they have in Europe. They have a left-wing party and they have a right-wing party, and the right-wing parties are nationalist parties. We happen to have an accidental situation here in which our right-wing party was a classical liberal conservative party. 
It doesn't have to be that way. We could have an and we could have a European situation here. The Democratic Party has moved increasingly in the form of a European left wing party, and it's increasingly possible that the Republican Party naturally will be led to be a republic a conservative nationalist party like they have in Europe. And that would be the end of any hope for to revive a constitutional Republican Party for years and years to come, if ever. But if Trump should be defeated, by the way, I just tweeted the other day that the good news out of this debate, if you want to look at an upbeat because I, I see you, I'm depressing the shit out of you. So, I mean, so I, if you want to be upbeat, there is no natural law that says there has to be a lesser of two evils. Two candidates could be equally evil, just in different ways. And so the good news is, is whoever wins means you avoid the evil of the other guy. So, hooray. Whoever, with all the bad things that go with the other person, you're going to avoid those bad things. You're just going to do bad things with this person. But look, at it on, look on the bright side. If Trump should be defeated, and with him is populism, a new Republican Party, I believe, must take the lesson of our Republican Constitution to heart and reject the judicial conservatism and deference that conservatives inherited from the left-wing progressives. It must embrace the constitutional federalism and separation of powers that are the structural ways we protect the rights retained by the people, and it must also embrace an engaged judiciary who will enforce all the strictures of our Republican Constitution to protect the individual rights of we the people, each and every one of us. Thank you. So how do you want to work this? Well, first of all, thank you for those wonderful comments. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and ask the first question, and we're going to turn it over to our audience for further questions. And on Twitter, questions can be submitted at, 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 Hudson at Hudson Events. And you can follow me uh, at Randy E. Barnett if you want to follow me on Twitter. Yeah, I have to tell you, it's a little edgy, it's a little political, not all that scholarly, but you might like it. Professor Barnett, can, can I draw an analogy from, from your discussion to uh, uh, the administrative law and Chevron doctrine uh, that uh, you say there's the Constitution, which can only be amended, and the, the government works under the Constitution, and uh, there, there's a fourth branch of government, which is kind of the... Uh, unelected bureaucracy, and uh, they presumably are supposed to be guided by statutes and uh, under Chevron deference, uh, eh, it doesn't really matter, you know, just do whatever you want, uh, which kind of undermines the legitimacy of statutes. Uh, is that a consistent way of looking at uh, your view of the Republican versus the Democratic view of the Constitution. You mean, is Chevron deference inconsistent with... Chevron would be the Democratic. Well, not yeah. even Democratic, because no one elected these I, Well, that's true. That's a paradox. of. Uh, I actually have a whole chapter of the book uh, called A Government of Men and Not of Law... A Government of Men and Not of Laws, The Rise of the Executive Administrative State, in which I criticize specifically Chevron deference and our deference, which are two forms of ways in which the courts defer to what administrative agencies who are not elected by anybody say. Um, it's essentially, let me, let me you, so the answer is no, I, re, I reject that, and I cite long passages from Justice Thomas's uh, uh, opinions in which he critiques these, both of these forms of deference. Um, and the Chevron case, by the way, was authored by Justice Scalia, who, and the, and the context in which that happened was, is that left-wing groups were objecting to Reagan administration officials who were uh, liberalizing certain regulations to free up certain uh, activities. And uh, so Justice Scalia and the Supreme Court decided that they needed to defer to the, the court should not be getting in the way of these regulators who were doing what they were doing. And so there was a political context in which Chevron got promoted, but now it's being used to, sh to shield everything the government does from, uh, from any scrutiny by the courts, anything that these unelected judges do. There are two basic reforms that I – there's three basic reforms I argue for in the book, and I have four chapters arguing for these reforms. And, and first is the revival of federalism. 
which would create a diversity of approaches to the most important economic and social issues we face at 50 state solutions to the most important economic and social. The more important the economic and social issue is, the more it should be decided by the states because that allows 50 state options and then people can choose to live in the state that most conforms to their preferences for policies, which is something they can't get by voting, but they can get by moving if the states differ from each other according to these things. So that was one thing. The other thing is to make Congress pass its own laws. The separate, enforcing the separation of powers you know, is the heretical suggestion that all laws should be made by Congress, all federal laws should be made by Congress and not outsourced to these executive branch officials who actually make all the laws that, are, uh, that, are, uh, that, we, that most businesses live under. Um, they're not made by Congress, they're made by executive agencies. Um, and this was a way, I tell the story, this was a way that the progressives in Congress could outsource lawmaking. They couldn't make enough laws to satisfy their demand for law, so they had to, they could, they, if they can outsource lawmaking to the executive branch, they can make as much laws as they can hire administrators to make laws. So it's like an infinite amount of laws they can make. Like air conditioning was a limit. But the only fact that there's only 535 of them is also a limit. There's only 365 days in the year. That's also a limit. But they got around that limit by outsourcing lawmaking to the executive branch. And then to add insult to injury, the third proposal I make is that we need an independent judiciary to enforce all of this. But at this point, the judiciary has let us down by allowing the outsourcing to occur in the first place, which was unconstitutional to start with, and then deferring to whatever that outsourced lawmaking people say the law should be. I'm going to turn it over to our audience. Uh, please state your name when you get uh, the microphone and uh, uh, identify yourself. Uh, right, I, I'll let you point. I'll let you point. Okay. You know these folks, Gen maybe. Gentlemen, the second. Right now. Uh, yes, my name is Will Higgins with the Institute on Religion and Democracy. My question is, um, in Federalist 51, James Madison says that we must first enable the government to control the uh, people and then enable it to control itself. Um, and so uh, why is that not a suggestion that the foremost role of the government is to control the people um, you know, before it actually checks itself with the Constitution? Well, the Madison, I talk a lot about in the book about um, a document that Madison wrote, uh, which I highly recommend to you. It's called The Vices of the, American, of the, United, of the Political System of the United States. And it was a document he wrote in 1787 as he was getting ready to go to the Philadelphia Convention. He'd finally worked behind the scenes. I tell this story, too. He'd worked behind the scenes to get the Philadelphia Convention. They, showed, they had a previous convention in Annapolis. Not enough states showed up, so they couldn't do anything. So now they needed to get all the states there. And the way to get all the states there, in part, was to get George Washington in on it because he was the towering political figure of the day. And Madison worked tirelessly behind the scenes to get George Washington finally, and he was very reluctant to do it. And he finally agreed to do it. And then when he was in, everybody got in, and they all showed up in Philadelphia. But Madison then retired before the Philadelphia Convention in April of, the, of that year. He went back to Montpelier. He was in Montpelier, and he was in his study. And you can go to Montpelier, and you can go into the study where he writes this document. And he, he, he studied up on political theory and the history of republics and the history of governments. And he did so also with a chest of books that, that Thomas Jefferson had sent him. Jefferson is 10 years older than Madison. He's Madison's mentor. He's in France as representing the United States in Paris. And, uh, but he sends him a, a chest full of books, and Madison reads these books because he's trying to solve the problem, which is what? Why are we in such bad shape here in the United States? And he decided that the source of the problem was the injustice of the laws of the states, which, first of all, tells you that he doesn't think just because something becomes a law, it's just. A law could be unjust, and it could be unjust according to what measure? It's unjust according to the measure of natural rights, which is what the Declaration says. And what the source of the injustice was, he said, was that states were too democratic. They were too majoritarian. He posed a thought experiment. He says, put three people in a room, make two people interest adverse to the rights of the third, and then let them vote on the outcome. Is, are the interests of the third going to be protected in this situation? He says, and it's no different if it's 3,000 people and 2,000 people, the interests of 2,000 people are adverse to the rights of 1,000. So he believed that the first duty of government was the protection of rights. And so you're right. In, that, in Federalist 51, and, and, and this was a common thought, we first need an energetic government. The point of the Constitution was to create an energetic government, a government with power, unlike the, the anemic Articles of Confederation where the government didn't have enough power. They need enough power to protect our rights from domestic and from foreign threats. 
as well as to open up a free trade zone in the United States, which is what the commerce power was there for, and to help negotiate agreements, commerce, treaties of commerce with other countries, which Congress really didn't have the power to enforce under the Articles, and it was to do all of those things. But at the same time then, how do we protect ourselves from our protectors? So you're right. The first thing is we need to govern, the thought was we need a government to protect us from each other and from foreign threats, but then we need something to protect us from the protectors, and that's what a written constitution is supposed to do, enforced by an independent judiciary. And as Madison said when he introduced the Bill of Rights as a congressman from Orange County, um, he said, uh, as to why there should be a Bill of Rights, he was persuaded to this position by Thomas Jefferson. He said, independent tribunals of justice will consider themselves the peculiar guardians of rights that are expressly stipulated for in the Constitution. So he viewed the judges as somebody that, could, that should step up. He was not optimistic they would, by the way, because his experience in the states were that judges did not enforce rights. So he was not optimistic about judges, but he thought that's what they were there for, and hopefully they'd do some good. It turns out they haven't. Well, they've done some good. Next for a right gentleman in the brown suit. I'm Norm Curlin from the Center for Economic and Social Justice. Uh, justice being in the preamble right after it gives the purpose for forming government to establish justice. You gave one of the most brilliant talks that I've heard in my life. I come from the University of Chicago, the law school, and they don't teach justice at the University of Chicago Law School, nor at Harvard, nor at any of the other law schools. Uh, as a matter of fact, the living constitution comes from Holmes and, and his pre predecessors. So Harvard has brought us, brought most lawyers to believe that uh, in, in the problems that you perfectly described. Can I interrupt you for a second? Just to, I'm just going to do a footnote to what, you're, what you said. In the book I talk about, it was James Bradley Thayer, a professor at Harvard, who developed this idea of judicial restraint, probably is most responsible for Holmes, another fellow Harvard law professor, taking up that view. And you're right, Brandeis and Frankfurter, they're all Harvard people, carrying this, this idea forward. And that's the Harvard part that Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. kind of left out of his account when he starts going after the Yale guys. Right. Uh, there, there are three quick points I'd like to make. One is that you can, you ought to take a look at the UniteAmericaParty.org because I think everything that you said is contained in the, in the, in the platform. So just look it up. The second is that uh, from Yale, I had a professor who was supposed to be teaching constitutional law, but they didn't allow him to. Uh, his name was Krosky, William Krosky. He wrote a book called uh, the, uh, the Politics in the Constitution back in the 60s. Oh, yeah, was 50, it was in the 50s, yeah. 1953. In which everything that you said, he said, and I'm just wondering if you're aware of that. They wouldn't allow him to teach constitutional law because of what he was saying. He was a brilliant guy. Uh, the, the, the third thing is economics because I think a, a good deal of the problems, uh, the, the excess use of the state vis-a-vis -vis the power of the person uh, it comes from economics, so basic in terms of the social order. And are you aware of the book by Lewis Kelso and Mortimer Adler? Adler used to teach the, the philosophy of law at Chicago. Uh, and, and the book was called The, the Capitalist Manifesto written in 1958. It was a bestseller for a while. Yes. Well, I'm not aware of the last book. I am aware of Krosky's book. It's a three-volume work, which I've read. Um, he doesn't say the same things I say by any means, I should tell you. Um, he, he uh, It's sort of a side issue, uh, so I don't know that we need to bother everyone else in the room with our views, of, our respective views of Krosky, because I'm not a fan, and you are, and since you're such a fan of my talk, I don't want to argue with you too much. <laughs> Um, but um, Krosky was part of the group. Before, they, before the, uh, the left threw in completely with living constitutionalism, they argued the living constitutionalism throughout the, 19th, throughout the 20th century, the early 20th century. They said, our constitution is a horse and buggy constitution. We need to update it with the times, blah, 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 blah. But there was a wing, as you can imagine, of the progressives who argued that, no, 
we don't need a revolution. We need a restoration of the original meaning of the Constitution. And they found the original meaning of the Constitution largely in opinions of John Marshall, which got read to be as broad and capacious, even bro more broad and more capacious than they actually were, and they were plenty broad enough. And at this point, Krosky starts his major project, which took him years and years and years to do, which was to defend the New Deal on originalist grounds. By arg yes, by arguing that Congress had a plenary power over the national economy, be and he went through the Commerce Clause and he said, for example, among the various, among the several states means within the states. Um, so he was trying to defend the New Deal from, a, from originalist grounds, but by the time his book was published in the 1950s, the New Dealers had already taken control of the courts, they'd already won, and at that point, they were much more interested in living constitutionalism, and they were no longer interested in defending what they were doing on originalist grounds because they had rejected originalism. And as a result, Krosky's masterpiece was largely forgotten, neglected, and, and put aside because the people that he was writing for were no longer interested in the analysis that he had to present. That's my take on it. I've seen a lot of, you're shaking your head, you don't agree with my take on this, but why don't we keep this? Why don't you we keep this amongst ourselves? Let's go to the gentleman in green in the back, and then we'll come up front on this side. Uh, I want to reiterate uh, what the gentleman ahead of me said in terms of the talk. This is the best talk I've seen in a while. I am not a lawyer, so I wrote my question down because I'm not that eloquent. Um, Could you please identify yourself? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Paul Mandelson. I'm with uh, Congresswoman Susan Brooks from Indiana. From um, Indiana. Yeah, Indiana. Um, so the Wall Street Journal, I forget who actually wrote, wrote it up, uh, did it, did it editorial on your book and while praising it, they said that there was a danger of conservative judicial activism in the, in the sense that it would delegitimize the court, that only by the court staying above the fray and the dirt of politics does it retain the reverence legitimacy that allows it to be effective referee. And I was just wondering what your take on that was. Thanks. That review in the Wall Street Journal was written by a former student of mine, Adam White. Uh, he was a student of mine when I visited Harvard and taught there. And uh, But he was a student of mine in contract law. And let me just tell you, as much as Adam disagreed with me uh, in that review with my book, he also disagreed with everything I had to say about contract law, too. So <laughs> even though he was a really brilliant guy, and in fact, um, I just spoke at an event he was putting on uh, for the um, uh, Hertog uh, in Foundation on Monday, and he was the one that invited me to speak. So I really like Adam a lot. He, he writes a lot for the Weekly Standard. He works for the Hoover Institution now. I don't agree with what he has to say. I actually tweeted my response to that review which was, Barnett likes judges, judges are bad. That's the review. So um, I, I just think that, um, uh, the, first of all, the, the book is about judges. But here's the other thing about it. The part where the conservatives don't like some of what I say, some conservatives don't, Adam is one of them, um, is when I talk about judges invalidating laws because they're irrational and arbitrary, which is what I think you have to do in order to protect the rights retained by the people. And federal courts should be doing that to state legislation. But I save that in the book to chapter 9. This is the last chapter before the conclusion. Because the f previous three chapters were about how judges should be upholding the limited powers of Congress to permit 50 state solutions under federalism, and how judges should be enforcing the separation of powers so that we wouldn't have an executive administrative state. And about these things, all conservatives ought to agree. And I think probably do agree. And then if you're reading through my book and you're a good old-fashioned conservative who does believe judges should be invalidating laws and is not committed to judicial restraint you know, in the extreme, you only have to get off the boat in Chapter 9. It was written in order for that to get you right up to that point. And that's kind of where the disagreement is. But here's what I think. Since our consent as a people are never actually solicited to the government, uh, the only consent that the government can claim to rule us is what we call presumed consent. That's what it was called at the time of the founding, presumed consent. What can we be presumed to have consented to? And I just don't think it's the case that people can be presumed to have consented to judges making irrationally or arbit imposing irrational or arbitrary restrictions on their liberty. And by irrational and arbitrary, I literally mean, I don't mean things we just don't like. I mean literally irrational. You claim you're doing it for this reason, but this is what you're doing, and what you're doing doesn't line up with what you say you're, why you say you're doing it. Why might that be? Because what you're really doing is trying to help out your buddies. 
and you're not really trying to accomplish this noble goal that you say you are. That's an irrational law. An arbitrary law is where I treat you differently than you, even though there's no relevant difference between the two of you. Why might that be? Because I'm trying to help you out as expense to you. I don't think it can be fair to say we've pre we, we presumably have consented to that kind of restrictions on our liberty. And I think we need a judge. We need judiciary who's prepared to look at state laws and see if they've done that. So here's the bottom line of my proposal. We need 50 state solutions to the most important social and economic problems. So states should be making most of the important decisions, and we don't have to leave the country if we lose our political fight. We can just go across the state line to the next state. But within the states, I think there are outer guardrails that are provided by the Constitution against irrational and arbitrary laws, which are essentially lawmaking in bad faith to help out certain people as opposed to other people, the favored people, the insiders as opposed to the outsiders. And within those boundaries, within those guardrails, and judges need to be there to enforce the guardrails, and they also need to be there to enforce limited federal powers so the decision making gets dispersed. And I believe it was John Roberts' refusal to do that that brought discredit on the judiciary. And that has delegitimated the Supreme Court to the point where the, for the first time now, the approval level of the Supreme Court is really has gone down. It was high, very high, in, all the way up through the Obamacare case, and then it started to plummet. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Of course, not doing their job. This gentleman in the front row. Thank you very much. I'm a member for UNESCO Task Force on Intangible Cultural Heritage, and we include forms of government. So various countries provide their intangible cultural heritage. My question is more specific. In the UK, some areas are ruled by Sharia, Sharia law. What is the challenge for you, uh, for your constitution of Sharia law? Thank you. Right. Well, I don't think that um, the government is empowered to impose any religious doctrines on the people. Um, the only thing that's there for is to protect the pre-existing rights uh, that we have. Now, many people believe that we have the rights we have because they come from God, at least in some way they come from God. But that's not, But whether you believe that or not, there are these fundamental natural rights. That's all the government is there for. And they're not there to impose a moral code, whether that code comes from Islam or whether that code comes from the Roman Catholic Church. They're not, they're not, in our country, we're, they're not supposed to do that. Uh, and so that I would be opposed to that um, here, uh, as, and I, would be, I think it's a bad idea elsewhere. Gentlemen, here with the necktie, and then you'll be next. Yes, my name is Pat Kurovsky, uh, Voice and Noise Foundation. I'm not an American. Which, which, which foundation? Voice and Noise. Voice and Noise. It makes a lot of noise. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I knew what you were saying. Yeah. Uh, You're not an American. Where are you I'm from? I'm not uh, from Venezuela. Okay. I came up here about 15 years ago, and I've always been amazed at one of the most important things that happened in 1988 does not have a lot of track. Uh, at that moment, the U.S. accepted with the Basel Accord that for the purposes of capital requirement of the banks, the risk weight of the sovereign was to be 0% and the risk weight of the citizen, we the people, 100%. I don't I can't get hold of the concept of that is a presumed consent there that the citizen accepts that they have to <laughs> be charged with much higher capital requirement than the government. And that is something that is not really, it's not even discussed. And it is a clear international agreement were accepted by the U.S., risk weight sovereign, 0%, risk weight citizens, 100%. Where is that? Well, I'm just going to let this be a comment rather than – I don't have anything to add to what you said. So I would just let this be a comment because it isn't exactly a question anyway. So you're, you're on the record, sir. How about uh, in the back of the room there, that gentleman back there? He's been very patient uh, after this. Oh, Jack, that's okay. Edward Roeder, Sunshine Press. In the past roughly 60 years, there have been huge – efforts to politicize the court from the left and the right, roughly since Brown. And 
it's had tremendous impact on the parties. In the South, most of the right-wing Democratic senators who were promoting what was called strict constructionism in the 60s and 70s uh, were Democrats, and now they've been replaced by Republicans almost to a man. They were all men. The two big issues before the court during this period have been privacy and civil rights. And the court has moved on these issues kind of in defiance of the political parties. Could you just comment on how this relates to your political definition of the strains of thought governing the Constitution and, and the judiciary in its interpretations on privacy, both with regard to abortion rights and with regard to all the spying that Edward Snowden disclosed and on civil rights ranging from the issues flowing out of Brown and the current LGBT movement? Well, let me say that the politicization of the courts is nothing new. And in fact, Teddy Roosevelt ran on the, making the Supreme Court his issue. And Justice Holmes, he named specifically as the kind of justice that he thought all justices should be. And he was an, a, a radical restraint justice that, that Roosevelt had put on the court as president. And it was in the, in the 1912 election that, Re, that Roosevelt made the Supreme Court the issue. He, and I talk about in the book about uh, an address he gave at Carnegie Hall, um, which was covered by the New York Times on the front page of the New York Times. And he's lauding Justice Holmes. It's even, on the, it's even in the subheadline headline of the story that covers his speech as the model of restraint, um, the Thayerian restraint from Harvard. Um, so he made the Supreme Court a political issue because they were getting in the way of progressive laws by a progressive legislation by invalidating laws as under the due process clause and on the, at the federal level under the commerce clause. And so the politicization of the court goes a lot farther back than you, you suggest. Well, the, I think, I, I think one of the points of the book is to take a longer vision than just the past half century or so. Starting in the past half century or so is starting in the middle of the story. In fact, it's starting the, the last third of the story. And I think it's important to back up and see what happened before that happened in order to understand what was happening then. As for the, the idea that, uh, that, re, that the Democratic ob obstructionists to civil rights were replaced by Republicans, um, I think that is a, a widely uh, shared uh, narrative uh, on the left that has been pretty persuasively debunked. I would actually recommend Dinesh D'Souza's most recent book that talks about this. Um, even after uh, the, ri the Civil Rights Act was enacted in the South, um, where Republicans got their votes from were in the more prosperous, well-to-do cities. And the rural, racist Southerners continued to vote Democratic. They actually didn't stop voting Democratic. It was that when, when, the, when, the, when the prosperity of South increased and you had also a lot of immigrants that came from the North, that's when the Republicans started to do better. And it wasn't a one-for-one -one replacement of the old segregationist Democrats with new uh, somehow uh, reactionary right-wing Republicans. That's not actually the story that happened in the South, but that's somewhat of a side issue. Um, so I, I would, I mean, beyond that, I think I don't have much else to say. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Thank you. Jeff Anderson with the Hudson Institute. Um, like you, Professor Barnett, I've been fighting Obamacare since 2009, so I applaud your efforts and also your, your victory at the Supreme Court in arguing that the, uh, the right to regulate commerce is not a right to compel commerce. I think that was I mean, a crucial win, even apart from the, the loss on the, on the, the wider case, I guess. Thank you. Um, I have a, a quick three-part question for you. Um, the first is, there's no question that rights come first and then government. Um, but my question is, where you pulled out your copy of the Constitution a moment earlier, where in the Constitution is the power found for judges to act as, as you describe, specifically for judges to declare what our unenumerated rights are and impo impose those uh, readings? Where in the Constitution is that? Second question is, what do you think of Obergefell, the gay marriage case? And the third question, back to Obamacare, is I agree with you that the individual mandate should have been struck down. 
But why does it necessarily follow that the rest of the 2,400-page monstrosity needed to be struck down if the unconstitutional part was the individual mandate? Why couldn't the court have just struck that down, maybe the related insurance provisions, and then said, you deal with the rest of it, Congress? Well, you've raised, these are not just three little questions. These are three, like, huge questions, each one of which could actually occupy a lecture. So I'm actually going to confine myself only to the first of the questions. I'm going to pass over the severability issue, and I'm going to pass over the Obergefell question, and just stick with where does it come, where does, where in the Constitution does it give courts the power to do this? Well, first of all, the Constitution does create what they call the judicial power, so that you have to ask, what is the original meaning of the judicial power? And in my last book, I gave you, I provide example, I don't do it in this book, but in my last book, I provide example after example after example where people at the Philadelphia Convention assume that justices have the power to invalidate unconstitutional laws. This is not something that, it was said by conservatives in the 50s and the 60s that this was a right that was invented by John Marshall in Marbury versus Madison. That's false. Not only does Hamilton argue for it in Federal 78, and, uh, but it was, it was assumed by many, many people in Philadelphia. There was no one, in fact, in the whole entire Philadelphia Convention that denied the existence of that power to invalidate unconstitutional laws. There was one person who said he didn't like it. And then somebody else said, well, you know, I understand why you might not like it, but I don't understand, I don't see what the alternative we have is. And that was it. Somebody who agreed there was such a power, but he didn't approve of it. Other than that, they all assumed, and it comes out in many different areas of the Philadelphia Convention, including the discussion of the Council of Revision. Because one of the reasons why they, that was argued against why uh, having a Council of Revision, which would be a body that could negate laws later on, they could revise laws in the executive branch. And they negated it in part because the proposals were to put judges on that council. And they said, no, it would be improper to put judges on that council because they are going to pass upon the constitutionality of laws when it comes to them in due course through the judicial system. And that would give them two bites of the apple. They could invalidate laws on policy grounds here and have to deal with constitu unconstitutional laws later, and that's a conflict. So even in the discussion of rejecting the, the council, it was done on the basis that it was assumed that judges would have the power to invalidate constitutional laws. So that, I think, is a canard. It's a conservative canard that needs to be dispersed with. But that's not exactly what you were asking me. You were asking, but I wanted to start there. You were asking me with the power to identify our unenumerated rights and impose them on the people. And I think that's really the postmodern, the post-New Deal way of looking at how judges should do their job. It's the post, in, in the post-New Deal order, the way judges have worked since Caroline Products and footnote four, judges identify certain rights as fundamental and they give enhanced scrutiny to those, any laws that restrict those rights and all other laws get virtually no scrutiny. And that was done on purpose because the laws that would get no scrutiny would be economic regulations, and that's what they, that was what the New Deal justices wanted. They wanted to permit all economic regulations to be constitutional. But then they were going to say, well, but there's maybe some personal rights, some more you know, fundamental rights that we're going to protect. Those are the big ones, for example, that are mentioned in the text of the Constitution, the first ten, amend the first ten amendments. Well, it was convenient for them because most of the rights in the first ten amendments did not involve economic liberty, although the takings clause kind of did, and they kind of got rid of the takings clause, too, while they were at it. So they enhanced the protection of the fundamental rights because they, they, that would allow them to have free economic, you know, liber, you know the free economic regulation with no scrutiny. And then they added some unenumerated rights to the list, like the right of privacy. And it's at that point conservatives, you know, threw a fit. Um, although no conservative justice who gets nominated to the court will, con will, will argue that Griswold versus Connecticut was wrongly decided, which was based on a right of privacy as well, which is that you should have a right to use contraceptives. No conservative has ever said that's wrong. They just say it's the, it's the, when it's applied to abortion, it's wrong. So, but you see the whole approach here was to privilege certain rights and then judges get to figure out which the privileged rights are. Conservatives are okay with privileging the written rights. They're just not okay with adding unenumerated rights to it. I think this is the completely backwards way of looking at it. And I reject that in this book. I think that we shouldn't be privileging certain rights. We should be protecting all liberty. 
which is protecting all liberty across the board. Judges should not have to decide which liberties are fundamental. And the way we protect them, though, is by examining a restriction on liberty and seeing if it's irrational or arbitrary. Laws that are not irrational and arbitrary that restrict liberty are constitutional. Laws that are irrational and arbitrary that restrict, re restrict liberty in an irrational, arbitrary way are unconstitutional. And it doesn't matter if that liberty is in the Constitution or not in the Constitution, like the liberty to raise your own child. Where does that come from? Do you not have the liberty to raise your own child? Or is that a law uh, that there's no constitutional right to that? No. That's one of the many liberties that should not be irrationally or arbitrarily restricted. By the way, that means it can be rationally and non-arbitrarily restricted under this approach. And what does it mean? I already explained to you what it means. Did I? I can't remember. I've talked about this Cato yesterday, so maybe I didn't. What do I mean by irrational? I think I did, I did say this. An irrational law is where the means don't line up with what you say the ends are. Suggest, oh, I did it. Suggesting that you're really doing something else. Or when I treat this person differently than that person, meaning, and, and I don't have a good reason for distinguishing them, then that's arbitrary. If the laws fail that, they should fail. So our emphasis should not be on privileging certain rights. It should be on identifying whether, whether states and the Congress are exercising their just powers. So what we need is theorizing, to the extent we need any theorizing, about what is the appropriate powers of the legislature. Not what rights we have, but what powers do they have. And here's the other thing. The last retort, this is somewhat of a polemical point, and that, that is this. For people who don't like unenumerated stuff, because it's unenumerated, where's the police power of the states enumerated in the Constitution? There's no police power of the states mentioned in the Constitution. You might say, well, it's assumed. Of course it is. Of course it's assumed. Just like the rights retained by the people are not only assumed, they're referred to in the Ninth Amendment. Yes, they're assumed too. But these unenumerated powers that courts, that, that legislatures are exercising, they're unenumerated, just as unenumerated as unenumerated rights are. Even, in fact, they're more unenumerated than unenumerated rights are because there's no reference to the police power at all. And yet that's okay, even though they're unenumerated. I think it is okay, by the way, for states to exercise unenumerated powers. But we need a theory about what that power is because here's what we know it shouldn't be. It should not be unlimited power. Any power, all power, because unlimited power is tyranny, and people cannot be presumed to have consented to tyranny without expressly doing so, and they didn't expressly do so. And at that point, I would say the outer boundary of the power, the unenumerated powers exercised by the states is that they may not restrict our liberties irrationally or arbitrarily. And then... With that, Professor Barnett, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. We have lots more questions. Uh, please feel free to ask Professor Barnett, and there will be a book signing right here. And by the way, the book is $18, and uh, that's actually a few pennies less than you'd have to pay on Amazon if you want to get your copy here. And I'm happy to sign any books if you do buy them here. Thank you very much. Thanks.